Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all having a good cedar. Uh, I'd like to welcome you back uh, for Wednesday. And we're going to start off with our plenary session. So first we have our early career science highlight number two, investigating multi-scale gravity wave dynamics with the complex geometry compressible atmospheric model, CGCAM. And this will be Wei Jun Dong. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Moon Jun Dong. This is my first time in front of so many experts, so I'm a little nervous. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to talk about investigating multi scale graduates with CG Cam. Uh, I'd also like to thank my colleagues, uh, David Face, Tom Slane, and Alan Liu, and others for their significant contributions. Uh, this work is mainly supported by the NSF and NASA funding. Uh, uh, this gradually, gradually, uh, gradually can play imp uh, crucial roles in transferring energy and momentum within the atmosphere. Uh, and they are typically generated in the lower atmosphere. Uh, common sources include uh, topographic forcing, convective forcing, and uh, jet systems and others. Uh, once they generated, they can propagate upward. Uh, the, uh, pro deposited momentum, momentum in, the, in the mean flow and accelerated the mean flow, which in turn accelerated the uh, phase speed of gravity waves. This is called self-acceleration. Uh, gravity waves can break, uh, but it uh, uh, occurs at a higher altitudes where they attain a uh, large amplitude. Uh, their amplitude is so large, so they, they become uns unstable and dissipated. Uh, they also can inter interact with uh, other scale waves, for example, tides and uh, planetary waves. Uh, because uh, gravity waves are really high nonlinear, so sometimes, sometimes non numerical method is, uh, is an important tool for study such dynamics. So I will introduce uh, our model, CGCAM. CGCAM is uh, uh, CGCAM, uh, it's, it's, it's built on a finite volume framework and it, it can support a wide range of boundary condition, conditions. For example, it can, we, we can set the real terrain machine, uh, real terrain machine for mountain wave studies. Uh, it can, uh, we have two modes for the CGCAM. It can operate in direct numerical simulations where, where all the uh, small scale structures can, can be resolved directly. Uh, and, or in uh, large edit simulations uh, where the Small scale structures can be modeled. Uh, and CGCAM can also uh, be used for the simulated, simulated trace, trace variables, for example, polar atmospheric clouds and uh, air glow images. Uh, and CGCAM can also be used in data simulation. It's so uh, it means that we can, we can use uh, uh, some time, time wiring and space wiring uh, boundary. Uh, background conditions for, uh, to, to explore the large-scale large -scale waves and uh, small-scale waves. And uh, CGCAM can use stretch and block grids and, so that, and, it, uh, and it is optimized for uh, efficient performance on parallel computers. Uh, next, I will introduce uh, six uh, examples uh, using CGCAM. Uh, the first example is uh, for the gravity self acceleration and braking. Uh, so in this, in this figure, uh, so here is, a, here is the last figure. There, is a, uh, there, is a five, there are five individual panels, and each, uh, each depends at different times. For example, this is at uh, early times, and 20 minutes, and 30 minutes, and uh, 40 minutes, and 60 minutes. So at, uh, at the beginning, we can say the gravity wave is almost linear. Uh, as a gravity wave propagates upward, it can, uh, gravity waves can deposit uh, momentum into the you know, mean flow. Into mean flow. This means that it can accelerate the mean flow. Uh, so uh, this acceleration can alter the phase speed of the gravity waves. So it can be seen, but, but, but this uh, acceleration is non-uniform because, because of the, uh, the non-uniform 
uh, momentum flux. So uh, the, the, the non-uniform acceleration called part of the squared wave uh, speed up, but, uh, but other, other parts do not, so there is a strong kinking and uh, distortion. You can say strong kinking and distortion. So this, this time, this process can generate some uh, squared waves at a uh, higher altitude, you can say. Uh, this, this, this distortion can amplify over time because uh, the induced uh, mean flow can uh, uh, continue to accelerate the phase speed. So this will eventually lead to the uh, instability and the gradual breaking. You can say the gradual break can generate some uh, large scale Last scale waves and the small scale structures here and uh, here. Uh, so this this is, the X, this is the XZ piano and this is the XY piano. We are uh, at different times uh, at 80 kilometers. We can say if uh, without self acceleration, this should be, this, this should be linear. But we, but when due to the due to the self acceleration, uh, there is a ball structure here. And uh, or, or say circle structure, and uh, the some small scale dynamics here and here. Uh, actually, we can say the evidence from the observations. So here is a here is some ob observations. We can say in this figure there are some linear uh, wave structures, clear wave structures, and here uh, one gradual breaking. There are some uh, wave structures and some small scale uh, dynamics. So this is the evidence for the. Uh, for the gradual breaking and separate acceleration. Uh, so next I will talk about, yeah, gradual breaking can, uh, can impact the uh, trace variables. So next I will talk about the gradual impact on the PMCS. So in this case, we introduced a 3D Gaussian, uh, 3D Gaussian gradual packet at the lower altitude and uh, placed the PMC layer at uh, around 80 kilometers. So, uh, uh, it, it can be said from this, uh, this, this move is for the uh, S, uh, S particle number density. The, the, dark, the dark color bar means uh, there, there are less S particle, S, uh, there are less uh, S particles, so here. So it can be said when the gradual breaking and uh, propagate up, uh, propagate to the PMC layer, it can introduce, uh, it introduce uh, a large advection and uh, transport, or large scale transport and the subdivision of the PMCS. So there's a lot of words here, from a lot, lot of words here. And we compared our modeling results with the uh, same uh, imaging. So this, this figure, is, this figure is the, here is the, our modeling results, here is the uh, SIPS imaging. Uh, so uh, it, uh, actually our modeling results can, uh, can resemble the SIPS results, especially, especially for some, uh, uh, some, uh, Structures with uh, a large word with, uh, with surrounded by the small words. For example, this is uh, a large word here and a small, small word here, surrounded by the, and here is a large word and three small words on here. Uh, in, in this case, the large word is uh, the gradual uh, breaking and the, the initial disabilities contribute to the large word, but the small words linked to the uh, mean flow forcing. So such modeling is uh, encouraging because we can use such modeling for, to infer the MLT forcing. So this is, this is the second example. So next I will talk about KHI. Yeah, KHI is actually the is important source for the uh, gravity wave. And uh, yeah, I will use the uh, third example and, and the first example to talk about how KHI can create energy to, uh, uh, up to gravity waves and create energy to uh, to the turbulence. So this case, this case I will talk about uh, KHI, uh, how KHI can contribute to the gradual wave. In this case, I put a shear at the around 80 kilometers, and this shear is specified, specified by the initial gradual waves. So in this case, uh, this, this figure shows uh, uh, different variables, the uh, horizontal wind, vertical wind, and temperature. Uh, you, we, we can say from this figure at the very beginning, the, the strong shear can cause the uh, uh, KHI, strong KHI. Uh, and after time, at least times, the, the, those KHI can generate some uh, large scale and high frequency gravity waves. You can say strong. Uh, uh, they have the periods around uh, from two, 
10 to 20 minutes, and they, their, their scale is from uh, around uh, 20 kilometers. And we also explore the uh, cloud ZT plot or don't say we did the horizontal wind. Uh, for example, this is the structure. It, it, you can see there is a face face band structure. It means the KTI can generate the both upward and downward propagating gravity waves. So we want to use the case to to say the KTI can create energy upward to uh, gravity waves. And this case is uh, how can I say KTI can contribute to the uh, turbulence. This means uh, KTI can create energy down to turbulence. Uh, there is a two uh, Im uh, there is a two inbound structures for the, for the tube and load. Tube and tube and load is actually the important uh, can index the intense turbulence. So KTI can can be elongated to into a tube like structures by the wind shear. So uh, from this figure we can say those those are the tubes. These are these are tubes and. And uh, we, which we will the KTI breaking and the resulting turbulence can twist and load the KTI into the uh, complex shapes. Uh, so uh, this uh, this this is the observation result from the air glow images from the James Hack, and this is the modeling result from from deep space. Uh, so we can say there are this this load. We can see the load from the air glow images, and uh, we 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 use the CT cam can produce the, all these uh, results. Yeah. So we want to use these two cases to, to say, yeah, KCHI is an important source for the gravity waves and it can also contribute to the turbulence. Uh, so I will talk about the, uh, in the fixed uh, example, I will talk about the gravity and tidal in, in, in interactions. In this case, we, we, we introduce the, introduce the time and the LT varying uh, at around, 80 kilometers, and uh, this, this movie is for the gravity wave evolutions. You can say the gravity wave, we, we, we introduce the gravity by just uh, input, uh, just add a terrain mesh at the bottom boundary and give a soft wind. So it can generate the quantum waves. Quantum waves can uh, propagate upward and breaking at the LTs. You can say the tidal can uh, modulate the gravity waves and uh, and the gravity wave can enhance the tidal at some times. Yeah. Uh, so we can see more details here. Uh, actually, gravity can attain lots of MPUs with uh, when the when gravity is trapped by the tidal wind. Here is the wind shear. Wind shear is the strong, uh, wind shear is the strongest here. Uh, oh, and here, on the, on the gravity can attain the last amplitude. The, can attain last amplitude here. We can say when the when last year, when last year moves to the 80 kilometers, the gravity can attain the last amplitude at 80 kilometers. And uh, when the when the when last year moves to the 80 km, 90 kilometers, the gravity can attain last amplitude at 90 kilometers. So uh, we also we also plot the tidal wind, origin tidal wind, and uh, and the model the tidal wind and their difference on the gravity energy. We can say. Actually, there depends. Uh, gravity can uh, uh, enhance uh, enhance the uh, wind at some times, and gravity gravity can can also uh, influence the gravity kinetic, kinetic energy. So, this is, we want to use the case to talk about the gravity interactions. Uh, next, I will talk about the from the CG cam to CAMNET. CAMNET is a machine learning model. So, in this case, we use a transformer architecture to train the to train a CG cam simulation data size. So in this case, we can say, uh, this is a CG cam result, this is a cam net result. We can say cam net results can resemble the, resemble the CG cam results. Yeah, it's very closely. But, uh, but one thing we want, I want to mention is that if we use a, a CPU, if you use a numerical, numerical method CG cam, it takes, uh, it takes around 40 minutes for a similar single case. But if we use a, uh, use a machine learning model, we can, yeah, only less than one second to run in a in user, user one, uh, 100 GPU. Uh, so here in the conclusion, conclusion is uh, CCAM is a highly parallel and uh, optimized compressed model. It has been used uh, widely for the gradual baking, self-acceleration, and other, other, other things. And uh, 
and the query will uh, serve acceleration and breaking can be a, a secondary source and the trace variables can be uh, in the indicators for the query breaking and as a secondary generation. And the K-check can exceed energy uh, upwards through graduates and downwards through turbulence. And the uh, test can modulate graduates causing the gravity energy to oscillate in a tight circle. And uh, the final one, last one, uh, where train, where train the machine learning model can serve as an efficient alternative for the gravity pen utilization schemes for in the GCMs. So that's my presentation. Okay, thanks for. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Lindsay's our microphone runner. Yeah, then, then, thank you. Uh, Wen when, when Jing, congratulations on your good work thank of you. this. My question is this. You said uh, you simulated the great wave cause PMC eventually form voids. But uh, many years ago, we also have uh, a simulation and also proved by our uh, higher observations from Antarctica. It is uh, longer period waves, say five hours or something. They can actually use the cold phase to form P -P uh, PMC. Sometimes, I mean, under the condition, the mean background temperature might be too warm for PMC to form. Yeah. Can you see similar thing in your mo model? Yeah, I think it's uh, another, another false thing for the PMC, PMC voice. But in this case, uh, we, we, are, we, we, we want to talk about the gravity breaking. It can induce the large scale, large scale motions of the transport of the PMC in the, in the PMC layer, and some uh, advections and uh, some emission to form the void. Yeah, I think this uh, is uh, yeah, another false thing for the void. One more question. There was a question in the slide. So it's also related to the P, uh, gra gravity wave transport of PMC. So has this uh, phenomenon, the effect of this phenomenon being observed? Yeah. You mean the voice being observed? It's a void, you know, the, the PMC transport by gravity wave. And the, uh, you know, you, you can observe that phenomenon. You know, ha has it been show up in the data? You know, look yeah, like, it, yeah. yeah. Actually, we did a comparison with the, between our results and the, submission, uh, and the observations in the figure. So from the SIPS results, we can see some, <laughs> so from the SIPS results, we can see the voice and uh, yeah, all these structures. Yeah, yeah, actually we see the, see the similar structures from the SIPS results. Yeah, SIPS imaging. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wenjun. Congratulations. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Emma Spanswick to talk about our science highlight number two, enhancing information content from Canadian auroral observations, new results and future plans. Welcome, Emma. Awesome. Thank you. All right, thanks to the organizers first for the opportunity to present some of our new results from our, our new network. Um, and also, I'd like to acknowledge the long list of um, co-authors on this talk. None of what you're about to see would be possible uh, without any of them. Now, everything I'm about to show you um, stems from one critical decision that we made while we were designing the Canadian network for auroral imagery for the Transition Region Explorer. And if you don't know what T-Rex is, um, essentially it's a nested, there we go, a nested network of all-sky cameras covering a region, it's roughly about two and a half hours of MLT, that threads from the subauroral region up to the heart of the auroral zone. And it had a primary science target to address mesoscale structuring in the aurora and its connection to magnetospheric drivers. And so we chose to, to uh, target this region where the magnetic field in the magnetotail goes from severely stretched in the tail into the more dipolar inner magnetosphere. And when we're addressing the science requirement, what we do is we we do what we always do, right? We sensor up that region. And so what we have is overlapping fields of view of about six all-sky cameras that cover this region. And then we build data layers or a data cube in that region 
with layers of optical information. And so you put in, you know, the 6300 angstrom line, um, you put in 4278 to get the blue line, you put in a near infrared line, and the idea is that when we've got all of that information simultaneously across that region, you can drill through that data cube and you can derive, for example, the precipitating electron energy flux or the characteristic energy. Now, I've highlighted here this 5577 um, because that was, this is the critical decision that led to where we got to today. Now, 5577 is, of course, bright enough that commercial, commercially available sensors um, can capture it. And so you don't necessarily have to use a narrow band filtered camera. And as everybody knows, if they work with me in the development environment, my favorite phrase is go big or go home. And so what we did was we went big. Okay, and so instead of deploying a narrow field of view camera, what we deployed was six commercially available, um, well targeted and, and very much modified, sensors that were giving us an HD view at three hertz Okay, across these six network uh, of cameras and was producing very valuable, I would say, publicly engaging data. And at the same time, we can leverage the green channel of that RGB, more photographic style sensor to get at um, the 5577 luminosity. And sure enough, that's just been published by Jun Liang in tw uh, 2024. And so what we have is this network of what is really quite astounding images and the idea with this, again, was that we would get structure, publicly kind of engaging images, and 5577. I will be honest, I did not think at any point that we would really be leveraging the full color capacity of these imagers. So I started to realize I was wrong about that about two years ago. And this is a slide from my AGU talk in 2022. And what you'll see up here in the top uh, left is a mosaic from uh, 2021, November 4th, this was, we, we had about four of the cameras deployed at this time. So this is a network of only four at the moment. And what you can see in there, if the projector um, is showing it, you can see a color um, gradation near the equator red edge in that patchy pulsating aurora. And you see this flash, it will come up in a second, that will go across the cameras, there it goes. Right, and you see this flash. Now normally when we see a flash in the all-sky cameras, we think, Snow plow, right? Snow plow, truck, car, something, right? But this flash went across two cameras. And what you're seeing next to it here is different kiograms taken from different magnetic longitudes, right? And you've, I've highlighted here this flash that goes through the field of view of two cameras. So this was not a snow plow, okay? Now, luckily within T-Rex, we were paying attention to the spectral composition of the aurora, and so we can dig in with a meridian imaging spectrograph. And so what I'm showing here, and it looks like these plots, this is a yellow and purple dashed line, but what that is, is that's actually the auroral spectra from before and after the flash went by. So they're right on top of each other, okay? And as the flash was going past, you get the white line. And what you see is there's an element of what we would call auroral continuum emission, right? So there's an elevation of the spectrum everywhere, and that's what's causing this um, gray-toned or white-ish flash as it goes by, and it's something that we've been acc accustomed to, I would say, with recent studies such as Steve um, and seeing this, but this is fundamentally different. Now, of course, seeing continuum emission, this is not new. None of this is new. Continuum emission has been documented back into the 60s, early 60s, okay? But most of the continuum studies that have been done on the night sky have been with relatively small field of view, um, sensors that are capable essentially of photon counting, right? Because you're looking at the night sky, which in general the continuum emission sits at, you know, a Rayleigh per nanometer or lower, right, in that range. But what we're seeing in this, this new camera is something that's very much different than that. It's of the luminosities of Steve. We're into the 10, 20 Rayleigh's per nanometer. But now we're seeing its structure. And so what has happened with these T-Rex RGB cameras is it's really given us a glimpse into the different color profiles that we can get in the aurora. And then using the spectrographic information that we have from meridian imaging spectrographs, we can dig into the spectrum. And when we survey the data that we have from T-Rex RGB already, we, we can see three real types of how this continuum emission manifests itself. So one is the flash that's on the far left. That's what I showed you, that was my AGU talk where we all went, okay. Um, 
Then we started noticing that this, these structures can come next to, they can be adjacent to, or embedded in the bright aurora. And this one we call kind of snow on the mountain. As it re repeats, you'll see it. It's a torch-like structure where you can see this white-tinged, gray-toned structure as it folds off the top of this torch, and you can even see some little picket fence activity alongside it. Okay. And then we also have structures that look more arc-like. This is a little hard to see in these, um, with this color profile on this projector, but what you see is we see a stable-ish arc, and then as that arc kind of dissipates, it leaves behind what looks like a continuum residual signature. Um, what I will say from the database that we have is that we find this, this structured, dynamic, and inconsistent um, behavior is by far the most common manifestation of these structures. Uh, and here's a set of examples. They're highlighted uh, with the red kind of dotted outlines here in each image. Um, and you can see in each, in each case, there's this just different tone to the aurora. And that's coming from an RGB camera, but everything I'm gonna show you now, we're using Rabbit Lake and Lucky Lake cameras for a reason. Um, and we're using those because those have co-located meridian imaging spectrographs. So we have access to the full spectrum. Okay, so while we're using T-Rex RGB to get at the spatial structure, and how the, these, this continuum emission patch or structure is moving, we're able to cor um, cor corroborate that with the full uh, spectral measurements. And when we dig in, here's an example uh, of what we see. What we've got is a keyogram at the top to give you a context. And as I said, uh, most of these events, if not all of them, are either embedded in or adjacent to bright auroral activity. And so you'll see here, this is the hour-long activity at the top where we're, we're taking from T-Rex um, RGB. The two dashed lines are where we've pulled the images that are below. This is that snow on the mountain event. And you can see the structure here. If I get the cursor right there, right on the top of that torch. And as it moves this way, uh, we're capturing that. That line through the center is the field of view of the meridian imaging spectrograph. So that's where we have the full spectrum information, where we can latch on. And below, you're seeing the two spectra from those two times, the orange spectra is from the orange dot on the left, and the blue spectra is from the, the blue dot on the right. And what you see as this comes over, um, or comes close to the, the field of view of the spectrograph, prior to the arrival of our snow on the mountain, you've got this relatively low luminosity um, spectrum. You've got a little bit of either, it's either air glow or very weak aurora that RGB is not picking up. Um, and then as this uh, snow on the mountain gets closer to the meridian imaging spectrograph, you see this elevation, and an elevation of the entire spectra. And that's the continuum emission that's coming through. If we dig in even deeper, because we have more information, and this is a different event now, um, we can look into the bands that are not associated with any known auroral um, lines or any air glow lines. And so for that, we go back to the Sternberg 1972 paper, and we, we look for his, his bands where he was studying continuum emission, and he des designated them as all clear, right? And these were the bands that he was using. And so we picked one, one region from 502 to 507 nanometers. That's right in the heart of one of his bands. And we started looking at the statistics. You know, what does the luminosity look like in this band for these types of structures that we're seeing? And what you're seeing here is one image from RGB. Again, this is the field of view of the meridian imaging spectrograph. But now I've color coded the field of view according to where we're going to take the statistics of the luminosity in this band. And so the gray region is above what we would call the bright aurora. And so you can see the statistics um, of the, the intensity, the optical intensity in that band. If we add all of those up, we've got a histogram sitting around sort of 50, 60 Rayleigh's. Okay, this is inclusive of the instrument response, the, the dark and everything. Um, and so we've got this relatively low luminosity in that band. If you look at the bright auroral region, which is south um, of where we've got this gray tone structure, you can see that's in that orange histogram, so you get a little bit of a slight shift. But again, lower luminosities. If we look at the statistics of what we see when we have these gray tone structures or that continuum emission, sure enough, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Okay, we've, that, in, that band where we have no known auroral or air glow lines has just shifted. And so what we see is a completely different population that is distinct. So we are fairly confident at this point that we are seeing with these gray tone structures, continuum emission. 
okay? So what's causing the gray toned emission? That's the, the million dollar question, okay? Um, with Steve, we were able to just isolate, right, the spectrum pretty clearly and it was, it was very clearly full continuum. It's a little bit more complicated when we've got things embedded in the aurora and the aurora is very dynamic um, as we're trying to go through this. And so here's our first crack at it. It's a little bit um, complicated, but here's our image, the same image we had from before, okay, in the top, and that there's three dots here, so a region which we're calling no bright aurora, which is above, a region from within the bright aurora, and a region from within what we're calling the continuum emission, okay? And those spectra are down here below, okay? And you can see the no bright aurora is the lowest luminosity. That should be Rayleigh's per nanometer, not angstrom. It is not that bright. Um, Anyway, so lowest here for um, no aurora, you can see the aurora, right, is relatively close in terms of its level in these non-auroral bands, um, but you see distinct rises, particularly in, in the, um, the nitrogen bands over here, okay? And then the green, or sorry, the blue on top of that is from within the continuum. Now, if we play the game that we say the aurora is roughly, roughly, you know, uniform across this region, half decent assumption from this RGB image where it's, it's inside a torture omega band structure and it looks relatively uniform. We can subtract off the continuum emission from, or the bright aurora from the continuum emission and we can get what we call the residual spectrum. This is what we think is the smoking gun where we're looking for what is that gray tone structure. And from within there, you can see a few things. So you can see the elevation of the spectrum. So you can see that we've got sort of this 20 Rayleigh's per, per nanometer um, level shift. Um, but you see distinct evidence of auroral activity in that residual spectrum, right? Of, of particular note, we've got the N2 first positive group over here. You can see that lay sticking out like a sore thumb. We've got the 6300 line, the 5577 line, and then we've got these other bands over here, these N2 bands, which are, we think, communicating the fact that the N2 has to be vibrationally excited to very high levels more so than even in the aurora, which we think then is evidence of very strong electron heating during these events. And so we've got some sort of interplay between the ionosphere state and precipitation, which is allowing the heating and thus um, the glowing of the continuum emission. Okay, so after me saying there was no information in the color other than getting out the RGB, um, or getting out the 5577, sorry. What did we learn? So we tried to use T-Rex RGB for 5577 and EPO movies. Well, what it gave us was much, much more um, because we believe there's information embedded in those color profiles. And so learning from that um, and the idea of using non-traditional imaging and looking forward, um, like any good scientist, we take exactly what we have learned on the last set and we apply it to the next set of instruments. Uh, and we're doing exactly that. So last year at CEDAR, I was happy to announce that we're moving forward with a plan to revamp the Canadian, um, Canadian ground-based capacity um, in advance of GDC. Uh, that plan is continuing under the GDC pause. Um, so we are going forward with advancing and refurbishing the ground networks in Canada. Uh, we have a lot to do. Um, and there's a lot of competing factors in how we design that network. Of course, we're trying to leverage our expertise and capacity in the optical imaging. Uh, we're trying to build on what we've learned from T-Rex, and that's a, been a key coupler now, especially with these new results coming out of RGB. We need to support enhanced GDC and Canadian science, because that's how we sold it, right? Um, we need to be able to maintain this instrumentation. We need to be able to leverage or provide a, a system that can be leveraged by the community. And so with all these competing factors, um, I like to say when we have multiple options and we have to integrate them all into each other that we end up with um, somewhat of a hybrid. And so <laughs> what I will show you now is this, um, this is our source um, that we are going to be building in Canada. And so we've got 27 core sites that will be going in. Um, installations will start pro not this next field season but the season after. Um, which will have 27 mags, 27 rheometers, the 23 RGB ASIs, right? So true color imaging um, across 23 sites and the fields of view you're seeing there, they will of course be augmented by eight meridian imaging spectrographs, giving us access to that full spectrum. 
Um, on top of that, the 16 uh, Redline ASIs will be deployed, as well as 27 GNSS and six Fabry Pro interferometers. So this is our source, as I will say. Um, so I will finish it up um, by showing you a mosaic movie uh, from RGB and just saying that you know, the non-traditional imaging techniques uh, have been, I believe, proven to be valuable um, for addressing some outstanding science questions and honestly generating new ones because I can't think what's structuring that heating both spatially and temporally, right? Why is it always near the edge or in the bright aurora? What is the interplay between the ionospheric state? Has it been preconditioned? And then the precipitation, right? So we're getting very, very distinct um, behavior and as of yet, we can't explain it. Uh, and I will say that we are using all of that information to integrate this type of information into future networks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. I always in really enjoy seeing all those auroral images and uh, now these movies and mosaics. So I think it's great and I think it's really amazing that we're getting all this new science from it as well. Uh, so let's have a couple of questions for Emma before we introduce our next speaker. Yes, I think Brian Harding has a question. <laughs> Unpredictable, F fascinating talk. So. Um, Regarding the smoke on the mountain, so unlike the aurora, where the motion is reflective of the magnetic flux tubes, Correct. our best guess for the NO2 continuum is NO, so it's yep. probably the neutral wind that we're looking at. Correct. Have you calculated the velocity, and is it consistent with that? We have not done that yet. Um, that is obviously the next step, and you can even see in that movie that it is moving it, it is moving differently, and it looks like, that's why we were saying snow on the mountain, it looks like it's blowing off the mountain, right? And so there's something there, and then pickets show up on the edge of it. Right, so, so there's so much, there's, there's a rich, I would say, like a, a very rich set of data there that we haven't begun to tap into. One more question. So the, new, uh, the newly funded instrument set up, are those different type of instrument co-located each, at each station or are you distributed in a different location? Uh, so what will happen is there's, there's 27 of the core sites. 23 of those sites will have the, the, the RGB cameras, right? So we'll get a full network image. The whole point is to try and completely sample that space, which, which is almost like eight hours of MLT. <laughs> right, all the way from suborbital to the pole. So the instrumentation will be distributed to try and give as uniform a view as possible for each instrument type. At different locations, yep. Thank you so much, Emma. <laughs> All right, I'm very excited about our next speaker. Uh, so first, I'd like to say that we've had a number of conversations over the past few years about DEI here in CEDAR. And many of those conversations have revolved around how we treat each other, how we uh, show respect for each other, and um, where we're all coming from. And those are all extremely important for creating an inclusive environment. But I think another important aspect of increasing DEI in um, our community is really helping to enable the pipeline. You know, if you think about who is eligible to be here at this meeting, it's really a very select few, and there's, there's a really tough filter to get here. So really, if you're going to be a graduate student, which is, you know, we have some undergrads here. I bring a ton of undergrads, but we have, we, really, it kind of starts at the graduate student level here. To get to that level, you really need to already have a bachelor's degree in either physics or engineering or computer science or something like that, and it takes a lot to get to that point. And then once you get there, you need to know that um, this community exists, and you need to know that there are uh, pathways to fund your master's or your PhD um, so you can keep going and, and actually be part of this. And I can tell you from working with um, undergraduate students who maybe are not from underrepresented groups that even those people don't always know exactly what graduate school is and the pathway to get there and how or even what a career in space physics looks like. And um, the only reason they happen to know, they learn that is because they meet me and I show them and I bring them here. 
Um, so I, I think if you're going to, if one way to increase diversity in our group is, you know, to, to start younger and to go out and reach um, students at this younger level, undergraduate, high school, middle school, you need to show them that there is this, uh, that there is this career, it exists. You need to show them the pathway of how you can get to it and then that it, it's possible. You know, there are ways to get funding once you get through undergraduate to actually earn your degree and, and, and have a career here. Um, and we need to get that message out. So through the, the HAMSI Citizen Science Project that I lead, um, I was at a ham radio conference, a technical conference called the uh, AWRL Tapper Digital Communications uh, Conference, and I met uh, Jesse Alexander, who is uh, funded uh, to work at the uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory on a project specifically to reach underrepresented groups and teach them about the electromagnetic spectrum through ham radio. And he does this on a national level. And I thought this was really great because he is, amateur radio is a really wonderful way to introduce young people to what we're doing here because it, there is a structure and a curriculum that's accessible to middle school and high school and college students, people of those ages, and these, this hobby is directly affected by all of the things, all the science we learn at CEDAR, and it produces that sort of uh, technical, uh, a technical uh, knowledge uh, that these students would need. And so, um, Jesse is going to tell you about a program where he brings this information to, um, oh, hold on, where he brings this uh, information to these students and uses amateur radio to introduce them to the scientific pathways. And so, um, I am very happy to introduce Jesse. Um, when you, he's going to give the talk today, but he's also going to be here all week, and so is his student Nijan, who has a poster this afternoon. And uh, Jesse, this is his first time at CEDAR, so we want to make him feel welcome. And same thing with Nijan, and we want them to understand what the CEDAR community is and how you get here because Jesse is going to be able to take the knowledge that he gets from this conference back and he's going to be able to re, you know, spread that message out to his group and his teaching and hopefully he finds that this is a, a good place to be and hopefully he shows that these, these people that this is a, a good pathway forward and something that's important. Now, um, Jesse isn't just anyone. He has a strong technical background himself. He's a senior IEEE fellow. He's been a ham radio operator for over 40 years, and he has um, more than 30 years of experience in technical writing, uh, designing for uh, people and companies involved with IT, wireless communications, telecommunications, and he's an award-winning poet, trainer, and entrepreneur. And so he has a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Howard University. Uh, so I would like to welcome uh, Jesse Alexander. Thanks. Thank, you, Thank you so much. Okay, let's get started. I hope the sound works. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, I really feel welcome. That's how I start class with the students in our program. And I think it's useful. We have to remember why we're here, how we got here, and what happened, and all that. So this is what I'm gonna talk about today. I hope you all are comfortable and everyone's good. We'll be here until about five tonight. Oh, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Real, trust me, trust me. Uh, so this is what we're, I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna cover fast because the time is limited and I'm a ham radio operator, and if you know anything about hams, we could keep talking until 2 a.m. Um, anyway, uh, I'm gonna use a model throughout this whole <coughs> presentation called STEM identity, uh, and we are trying to help our students develop their STEM identity. It consists of these three, um, oh, ooh, click to go back. All right, uh, it consists of these three dimensions, co competence, performance, and recognition. 
And so these are some of the questions that the students are asking, that anyone's asking who's developing, that all of you have probably asked at one point, uh, who, uh, who are developing their STEM identity. And, uh, and STEM identity, as you all know, because you're here in a community, is a communal thing. So this is the model I'm going to be using. You'll see it throughout the talk. All right. So I started this project, and I was looking for a photo of a black woman ham radio operator. Okay. And it was kind of tough. We go back in time, and uh, we're not there yet. Uh, I don't know about this. Not really. Um, and there's a great paper. This is a really good paper about ham radio with relationships to gender politics. So that's not there. She was my uh, adolescent heartthrob, but not really a real ham radio operator. Uh, here we have a real ham radio operator. Uh, she doesn't have a microphone in her hand. Um, this is Dr. Brenda Muhammad. Uh, she runs a program, a mutual aid program called Force in, uh, Force in, in New York, upstate New York. But she's not holding a microphone. Great person, though. So what does a ham radio look like? And why couldn't I find any pictures of black women holding a microphone? Well, here we are, fast forward to today. The general class license manual has a real black woman ham radio operator, Rhonda Leonard. There's her call sign uh, on the cover. And the, uh, the other guide that we use in our class, the general uh, license uh, study guide by Dan Romanchak also has a cartoon character of a black woman. So we're getting there, we're getting here. So um, here's a teachable moment from my own life. Uh, I went to an event uh, a while back, actually it was the event that, uh, that uh, uh, Nathaniel just described, and uh, someone asked me, are you in the right place? And I joked and I said, yeah, I think so. Uh, I saw the antennas on the cars, um, and I was challenged again, and someone stood up and said, no, that's Jesse, he's supposed to talk, you know. So here we go, right? You know, <laughs> uh, what does a real ham radio operator look like? I don't think we have time for this, so I'm gonna stop here and just say quickly that if you wanna watch this video, it's very inspirational, called Sam from Earth. I would highly recommend you do it. Um, I put this up on um, LinkedIn, and it got thousands of hits, and there were lots of ham radio operators who were saying, oh, this is what I went through, oh, this is great. Ham radio operators of all races, all backgrounds, all right, because they can relate to this story. So I'm, I'm going to, in the interest of time, not play this and move on. All right. <clears throat> Here we're going to do some of the hidden figures about uh, uh, <laughs> in wireless communications. We're always going to start wireless communications with the drum. That's wireless communications, right? And so we have Liebert Young, who is an early radio pioneer. And what I tell the students is, this, this is sort of like Bitcoin. Radio at one point was like Bitcoin, you know? It was hot, okay? Everybody was building radios and they were putting stuff together and antennas and stuff, you know? So here's one of the early, um, Liebert Young, one of the early uh, uh, experimenters. We also have uh, the Diné code talkers uh, who were, uh, whose language was used. And, I want to make a point about this. Uh, a lot of people talk about the code talkers just using language uh, to communicate, uh, I think it was World War II, in a way that no one else could break. Well, it's more than that. The code talkers worked with the US military and developed a, a library, basically a lexicon for use, because there's some words that didn't exist in Diné and other words that existed in Diné language that did not, ex that did not exist in, in uh, standard US English. So that was a co-development. I keep saying this with the kids. This is co-creation. This, um, this is Dr. Gladys West, one of the co-inventors of GPS technology, which we all are using right now. Um, this is uh, one of the first amateur radio operators. Um, uh, I don't have his name at the tip of my tongue, but uh, this, this gentleman is a polymath. He is uh, well good, well versed in English language as a writer. Uh, he's written manuals and he's also an engineer. Uh, this is a person I worked for on and off for 17 years at Bell Laboratories. His name is Jesse Russell. He's got gazillions of patents. 
uh, ran the Wireless Center of Excellence. Um, if you want to know about, more about him, you can do some more research. This is um, another Dr. West. Uh, he invented the electric microphone. All of us use the electric microphone. We have, how, how would we communicate without mics? Um, this, this talk originally is, is dedicated to my friend who is now Silent Key, uh, um, KB3IIE, uh, Ken, who passed away. I volunteered with him in a lot of volunteer stuff in Prince George's County, Maryland, including Red Cross. And this person is a new to me. Uh, Marion Clock, Dr. Croak, Dr. Croak invented voice over IP, which we're probably using right now in the form of uh, Zoom. So the point to that slide is that every, that black folks were involved in that, and not just black folks, but people of color were involved in what we now call wireless communications. All right, so here are some of the barriers to STEM identity, and I saw this great cartoon, so I had to hack it, you know. I mean, I like Linux and stuff, so anyway. Um, there is the goal, the STEM identity. What's, what's, what's in the way? There's a lot of in stuff in the way. The, the, there's risk that's transferred over to one column to the other, and actually, unfortunately, money. And so we can talk about this. This, is a great, this article talks about this, but what she doesn't do is she doesn't talk about this stuff here uh, in the article. She talks about it, but acts like it didn't come from anywhere. Actually, it did come from somewhere, and we need to have a conversation about that. This is an excellent book. I would highly recommend you read that book that talks about cast, cast that talks about racism in a different way. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, these are some of the questions that I'm asking myself internally. Uh, you know, what, how, what effects does this meta-racism, what effects does it have, uh, and how am I complicit in that? And um, how does this privilege manifest? And, and is it me or is it racism? I, during the breakfast, I actually mentioned something, and it's a slight diversion, but I'm gonna mention it now. Uh, one of the things, when, you wanna ask, when you're asking questions like this, it's useful to have is a crew, a group, a gang, a coterie. Uh, uh, you need a group of folks who are in your corner who basically have your interest at heart. And I say, I'm saying this to the young people. It doesn't have, they don't have to be the same race as you, but they just have to care about your progress and want you to succeed. You need people like that. They help you answer these questions. All right? All right, moving on. Barriers to STEM identities are real and uh, impede achievement. All right, so we've got, I'm just reading, just starting to read this book. What she's calling meta-racism are uh, the interlocking effects of all the things in this path, right? Uh, where I live in Prince George's County, it used to be a food desert until we got a uh, Aldi's. Uh, Prince George's County, Southern Maryland, is a sacrifice zone. What does that mean? That means people, all the power plants get sited in Prince George's County. I'm an electrical engineer by training. I didn't do power, I did communications. So in my naive brain, uh, I was thinking, oh, power plants are built when there's a need, when the load increases. No. <laughs> they're, be, they're built when, because they're profitable and, and they're built in zones where people are not as litigious as they are in other zones, all right? Okay, medical apartheid, right? Criminalization. These are all issues of meta-racism, the interlocking nature of, of, of race and caste. Uh, and there are some other prevailing problems that also impede, uh, you know, so. All right, how I developed my own STEM uh, uh, identity uh, with ham, using ham radio. I developed an alternative STEM identity at a certain point uh, in my career, and I'm just gonna quote a headhunter, he happened to be black, he said, you're too black and too old to get work in engineering. So I'm always, I mean, he told me, you know, I, I'm always, I'm like, I'm always, um, he was wrong uh, and stupid, uh, but anyway, so I'm not gonna give up. I mean, geez, I know all this stuff, so I'm gonna keep going. So I used ham radio to develop my own STEM identity. I, I did my own diagrams. I came up with some ideas. This is so, for something I call the emergency communication server or something, which is basically um, 
using uh, repurposed, uh, I, uh, repurposed uh, routers, uh, wireless routers, and making a mesh network. Um, I joined an identity-based organization, and I strongly urge the students in our, in our group to join some of these. I've joined uh, OMIC, which is a group of predominantly black amateur radio operators. I also joined my local CERT, and I was involved with ARIES uh, for a while. Uh, ARIES, and Prince, ARIES and CERT are very interesting organizations in Prince George's County. They have similar, um, oh, okay. Uh, oh, ooh, I just discovered the monitor there. Interesting. All right. Uh, <laughs> fascinating. Uh, uh, so anyway, and um, uh, they're two different or interest. They're two different organizations. Um, they they are uh, they have different they have different demographics, but they're in the same location. Uh, CERT uh, Community Emergency Response Team is predominantly black and significantly female. Uh, Aries, on the other hand, is t uh, is predominantly white, uh, with a smattering of black folks and very few, if any, women at all. So it's kind of interesting. The same area. Uh, but I'm not here to solve their problems. Uh, let's see, so here I am uh, doing a presentation at, uh, uh, at, at a national night out, uh, which is an interesting thing. Uh, and so this was my response to racism, basically developing an sort of intersectional response uh, to racism and, and also ageism. Uh, is developing my own identity inside the ham radio community. So I became a VEC, uh, a volunteer examiner, and I learned, <laughs> I did a lot of learning. I learned uh, uh, about the uh, 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 FEMA incident response plan and all that other kind of good stuff that people out here in California know. Probably all the, the, the kids this high probably know that. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. I uh, joined Skywarn, became a spotter, and in terms of price, I was, like I said, hacking a whole bunch of these little routers and playing around with them, uh, putting Linux on them. Uh, and uh, I already mentioned the net mess network. So that's how I addressed uh, discrimination. So here's how we help our learners. Uh, there are a lot of, our program is modeled after programs that other schools have. Uh, one of them is Cal Poly's uh, program, which I think is outstanding. Their first year engineering uh, program, they strongly encourage students to get their ham radio license. And I think that's great. So we, I modeled the program based on what Cal Poly was doing, outstanding. Um, I don't know, I don't see if Christina is in the audience, I don't see, oh, there she is. You see your paper? Yes, very good, excellent. And so I have borrowed, I've been using your paper and information from your paper, uh, thank you very much, uh, in, in this work. And there's also the great paper by one of your colleagues, it's the class by one of your colleagues at Rice, which is outstanding, and that's something else I just brought into the fold to use as we evaluate the curriculum and prepare it for open source release. All right, so I'm just, um, so let's see where we are. Uh, I think someone did in the breakfast reference uh, bystander training, highly, highly, highly recommend bystander training by the Right to Be organization, outstanding, all right? So we also use that in the curriculum. Uh, I'm just gonna keep moving. All right, now ham equity is a major bar barrier. I had fun with this slide, so I'm gonna warn you, all right? So one of the things about ham radio is that it costs lots of money. So the other part is that, uh, and so if you are already, there are a lot of people who have parents or friends and stuff in ham radio. So there's some people who've been talking to ham radio since they were this high, right? And so that's another form of equity. Uh, like I said, there's nothing like being in the same house with a ham radio operator. If you're family, you basically walk downstairs or walk around the corner to the bedroom and boom, you're on the air. Uh, and so that's what I'm talking about. Having your own uh, shack, so to speak, is a form of uh, um, equity. And then with all of that comes experience, right? Out in the field, 
doing real ham stuff and mentoring and connections. And uh, basically the big part of this is knowledge. So one of the things I've told students is that there are at least a couple ways of getting through the ham radio exam. You could sit there and study the questions and memorize them if you have a very clear mind, but you can also experience, and, and if you have ham equity, what I call ham equity, you've already experienced things, so when you take the exam, you're answering from your own experience. All right, so that's a form of equity that has to be overcome for people who don't have that kind of background. Very important. So we're trying to address that with our students by using remote, uh, especially the cost thing, by using remote, some of the free remote tools like remote hams and, uh, and, and others to, to basically use uh, radios that are sitting out there on the internet for, for people to use free of charge. So that's one of the things. The other things is I was hoping to bring a student or so or more to with me to Hamvention so that they could actually have interactions and communications and talk with other hams. And who knows, maybe even get some radios. Uh, that didn't work out. And of course, W8EDU. I love W8EDU. Uh, you know, I would, I could, I was joking with our students who went with us. That was just a great experience. Thank you. Uh, it was just a really, really profitable experience uh, on multiple levels. I want that duplicated all over the place. And yes, I could, between that and the makerspace at, at, uh, at Case Western, I probably could like live there, but that's a whole nother conversation. All right. Creating Ubuntu. Uh, uh, to, to sustain our learners in uh, their STEM identities. We're talking about creating a club or helping clubs form. There are a bunch of students who, unbeknownst to me until we got close to the end in one of our cohorts, who are all uh, students at uh, College of William and Mary. And in the previous cohort, again, unbeknownst to me, there were students who were college at, the, at um, Agnes Scott. And so we had Scotties, and we have, uh, and we had some folks in William, William and Mary, William and Mary team. They're just one person short of being able to form an ARRL ham radio club. <laughs> so, uh, and, and and I should say one of the students is going for their extra. So that's great. Uh, the other thing is community involvement. Uh, that also helps create people create STEM identities. It's not enough to say get a ham license. Right, the student has to, students have to talk about their own goals. Why do you want a ham license? And then the course needs to be, uh, that's one of our lessons learned, needs to be tailored to the extent we can do that uh, around the student's desires and needs. And one of the things that keeps coming up for students because of climate change is emergency communications. All right, the other thing to create a self-sustaining group is to to also have people who are instructors and also people who are volunteer examiners. And so this way we create a self-sustaining group. That's the idea. Or in our case, more likely self-sustaining groups. So let's see. Um, this something I came on accidentally. Um, so I'm, I, uh, you'll see here down at the bottom, there is a reference to the Encore uh, uh, group, they have a very good study, and they're showing in the Encore organization, they're one of these organizations, just I'll take a real quick step back, Encore had another name before uh, becoming Encore, and basically what they did was they found, uh, found uh, former senior um, people who used to work in corporations in various roles, scientists, engineers, et cetera, and they would sort of hire them or facilitate them coming back and solving current day problems. So they've morphed into a intergenerational organization that advocates for intergenerationality. Um, so on one hand, let me go back. On one hand, we have them talking about uh, cohorts of young folks and old folks wanting to work together. Um, I don't want to go that far back. And then on the other, we have a situation where uh, in the ARRL, there's a concern that ham radio operators are aging and that people are going to age out. So how do we bridge these gaps? 
The other part here is sort of a third part here is like, why is ham radio important? I think it's important. One of the reasons why it's important is that it gives citizens access to spectrum. And so I've got a few articles here about how much some companies pay for a spectrum. All right. So essentially you take a test and you get the spectrum free. So that's the way I look at this. So this finding in that report that Encore did, which is absolutely fascinating to me, uh, says that the very demographic we're targeting is looking for cross-generational interaction. This is important. This is not something I expected. This says that ham radio, I'm talking about my specific project, but what this says to me is that ham radio is an opportunity. So what we have are two, let me just step back a moment. We've got two, co two different groups of people complaining about sim something. One group saying they're aging out. We won't, we're going to lose the spectrum. We're going to lose access to it. The other side saying we're anxious. To, we keep seeing people saying we want to work across generations. We've got a bridge here that we should take advantage of. And we're also talking about people who are supposedly underrepresented, right? Who are underrepresented. But the significant part here is those very underrepresented folks are the people who want to work across generations the most. Y'all feel me? You hear me? I'm gonna, we're going to go to church for a little bit. Y'all, do y'all hear me? <laughs> so this is very important. All right. Now, everyone, all right, uh, this is my secret plan for world domination. I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it. So everyone, keep this secret, okay? It's very secret. Number one, I want one of these stations at every HBCU, starting with mine, Howard University. Two, I want ham radio stations at all of the science centers in the United States, at least, right, starting with the one I used to work at, Liberty Science Center in Jersey City. Uh, Liberty Science Center is significant in multiple ways, not only because I work there, but when there was the attack on 9-11, you could literally stand on the roof of that and see the uh, towers burning. So I think there should be, at every science center and science museum, there should be at least one ham station. All right, and I also would like to see our students uh, involved in clubs, and, and uh, we're even talking about rolling out our own. And so that's my plan for world domination, in addition to world peace. Um, yeah. Got to have that. I think I went over. Do we have time for any questions? I think we do. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was really a great talk. Thank you. <laughs> do we have any questions? We must have a question. I think they're just so amazed. Yeah. By what <laughs> um, I think, so I'd like to thank Jesse so much for coming. And as I said, please talk with him over the next few days and his student, Nijan, it looks like we do have a question. Uh, they will be in the poster session this afternoon. So, Bill? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nathaniel. I, I just had one comment. Um, I, I completely agree with the idea that we need to get a uh, ham radio station in at every HBCU and every uh, every science center and so forth. What you need, <laughs> QSL. Um, that is what you, I mean, the, the difficult part is getting a champion to work there because you have to have somebody who is on faculty or staff who is, an, who is a ham. Uh, because just putting the equipment there, it'll just gather dust, obviously. And that is a big challenge. Um, e even at big universities, sometimes it's hard to get a, what would you say, a critical mass of people who can even run a club station. I found this at UA. You know, you, you call a meeting of the club station at a, at a university with 30,000 students, and you get two or three people show up. I mean, we've got to do better than that somehow. 
Yeah, I don't have much to add to that because I agree. Uh, I, but one of the things, and I'm going to draw on W8EDU again, uh, that I thought was interesting was that, that W8EDU, if I may use the corporate term, became a, um, a revenue generator to a certain extent, all right? Because it became a reason that alumni would contribute. Uh, there were alumni who contributed equipment and money and time and that kind of thing. And so we, I'm not sure how to surmount all the problems you list, but one of them I think happened, the one, part of the answer I think is in that. The profile of amateur radio, uh, raising that profile will help overall, might help the school. And so now we get, now we get the administration on board and now we get students and alumni on board. And so it becomes another quote, profit center uh, for the school. So that's the best that I can do. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you. A couple of quick comments before we move along. Jesse wants a ham radio station at all these universities. I fully support that. I'd like to say that, um, you know, universities present certain um, challenges with getting these sorts of things set up, and one of them is financial challenges. Uh, there is a foundation called ARDC, which has a significant amount of grant money available that can do things like fund ham radio stations, and that's how I got a new one at the University of Scranton. I got a $200,000 grant from them, and Case Western, WAEDU, they just um, completely, you're redoing your towers right now, right? Yeah, there, and so there are ways to get past these barriers. Um, also, a quick advertisement for the Cedar Makers Club session at 10 a.m. You can come to that and you can hear a number of ways that we are using ham radio and amateur radio techniques to specifically address Cedar questions, science questions. So you can come to that session and you can see that link there. All right, um, next uh, we have another topic that's near and dear to my heart and that's um, scouting. Uh, I be, the reason I'm here at CEDAR is partly because of ham radio, but I did not learn about ham radio until I was a scout. And so now we're going to hear from Bryce Halter, Broad Impact CEDAR students and Girl Scout troops in San Diego. So please welcome Bryce. Hi, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Bryce Halter. Uh, I work at the Air Force Research Lab, and I'm also a graduate student at CU Boulder. And I am also a Girl Scout troop leader for some high school students in New Mexico. Uh, so this is a little bit of an eye chart, but I think it really speaks to the commitment that Girl Scouts has to educating young women and non-binary kids about STEM and the fact that they are able to achieve that. So um, what I did this weekend was I helped run a, uh, the STEM career education badge. So you can see that on the right. Um, it is like for all of the grade levels. So from the super smalls to the kids about to go off into, co into college. And um, it's very widely supported. Like um, SETI has sponsored badges. This badge in particular was sponsored by GM. So there's a lot of support also from industry and from NASA towards these programs. Um, so the impact of STEM activities really can't be understated for these kids. So these are, um, similar to what Jesse said, these are kind of the things about STEM identity. Their interest in it, their confidence in the material, their competence towards it, as well as what they see as the value of it. Um, so the lightest blue is if they've done no STEM activities, and then the darkest blue is if they've done several. So in a number of these, it increases their interest, confidence, and value of STEM up by 10%, which for a population that really doesn't make it to these kinds of careers is really important. Uh, so this was the event that happened on Saturday. So we made some space s'mores. We put marshmallows in a vacuum chamber. And um, one of the things that we emphasized was there's different kinds of STEM careers. So it's not just scientists. We had them also drawing pictures and trying to represent the experiment and how you would communicate it. And we also had some of them make it a little lesson plan. How would you teach this to the younger kids? 
Um, so you can see them all experimenting with different things. They started putting balloons and anything that would fit in the vacuum chamber in there. Um, and they went for a solid 30 minutes learning about what happens when things go up into space. And then after that, um, they made little career plans. So we talked about how do you get from where you are right now to where you want to actually go. And we had a large number of astronauts uh, that said, if not an astronaut, because that's scary, I want to do astrophysics or space science. So hopefully we'll see some of these kids in about 10 years. And then if you'd like to get involved, um, next year I'd really like to host an event like this again, um, potentially even at AGU if there is enough interest. Um, but also, if you would like to run it yourself, I made a little guide and you can scan the QR code to get a little lesson plan for it. And yeah, um, you don't need to be a girl to run the program as well. Um, seeing positive role models of any kind is really helpful for them. So, thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Bryce? Oh, right over here. Uh, Lindsay? Jesse has a question. Oh. <laughs> Hello? Oh, I just have a question. Well, great presentation, by the way. Uh, have any of the, your scouts been to the very large array out in uh, New Mexico? Uh, my scouts have not, but um, that is a field trip that I've proposed to them. So Excellent. We, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our last talk before the uh, break, uh, I'd like to welcome Danny Scipioni. And as we all know, uh, CEDAR science and uh, space science does not um, follow national political borders. And so we're going to talk about international collaboration. Thank you. Um, when I was asked to prepare this talk, I was kind of wondering where do we like to go with this talk? And for me, international collaboration, being Peruvian and start my career as an engineer at the Jicamarca Radio Observatory, international collaboration always seemed to be natural. Nothing that I need to evaluate, it just worked the way it was. It was always collaboration. I was always seeing scientists coming and going from the observatory and always keep me ongoing, keep me thinking about that this is the way to go. And always thinking that, looking at them coming to Jicamarca being like a career path for me, and it was probably a successful way to go doing international collaboration. But also makes me reflect on things that I might not look at before. And what should I be looking at? What do we expect for the international collaboration? And I was looking at, looking at some kind of ways to look what is important to look for the international collaboration. And I was thinking that we need to find five, at least five key points for a successful international collaboration. And one of the things I was establishing goals and objectives together. What do we want to achieve with this international collaboration or local collaboration? Especially if we want to install an instrument, what do we have to do? How are we going to pursue the goals that we will need to achieve with that? What are the objectives and what are the timelines that are expected? So everybody have it clear. We have to have also like a clear communication. It doesn't have to be something that I might think that I explain myself and he understand what I'm saying. It has to be very clear message. So we go, we both go or both parts go in the same way, working together and I think that is really important, especially when we are planning on having international uh, collaboration with something that is not from the same culture that we have. And we also need to work on respecting those cultural differences and thinking about how they work, if they have the same timeline that we do. Somebody said, well, it's right here, or go, it's, it's just a little bit of more over there, but it's, it actually takes a long time to get over there. And some people say like, yes, uh, next week or 
I'm just very close, but it's probably not that close, and probably that's something that is in your culture, and they have to think about it in a way that we continue and harmoniously work together. And also, we have to build on establishing trust and building these relationships. We have to invest the time and effort in building strong uh, interpersonal relationships. And I think that it's part of what it's important for us is have to build a community and you have to be involved face-to-face -face meetings. Now we have Zoom and stuff like that, but I think face-to-face -face, it will never be replaceable using uh, the online uh, experiences. And also about flexibility and adaptability. There's something that we think that nothing may happen. If we have the right plan, everything will come to a great success. And sometimes it's not possible. We are doing our best job, but there might be a problem with customs that we are experiencing in many of our projects. And they require more paperwork, and they require more supervision, and all this kind of stuff that slows us down. But we need to adapt, and I think also uh, it help us to, to get this better communication, better, uh, better international uh, collaboration. And with that, I will kind of present a little bit of the international collaboration I was asking my colleagues. As you can imagine, I'm Peruvian, so I'm from South America, so I have a lot of contacts in South America. But I would like to talk about, first about Peru. And I was thinking about that, as I was saying at the very beginning, I'm from Jicamarca Radio Observatory. So we, as uh, Jicamarca, we having this, uh, radar that's been around for 60 years, we have a lot of international collaboration. And this is just a quick example of all these different instruments that we have, the different institutions, radars that are installed all over Peru, and not only Peru, but also in South America. Like the uh, Ionoson Network from the Listen Project, that is PI is Dr. Cesar Valladares, and he's in charge of these different instruments. Also, we have and operate some uh, magnetometers as well. That is also there, so we operate them with taking. Also, we have some, uh, well, this is kind of the instruments that we have, the magnetometers, how to get the database, and that is something that, that we've been doing at, in Peru. But also, I was asking some of my colleagues, like, what are the new projects that you're working and require international collaboration? So. My friend Luis Navarro sent me this slide and said, well, we are working on this uh, collaboration between uh, NJIT, University of Boulder, Boston, Peru, IGP, and the Casaleo from Argentina. And we're trying to install these different instruments. So he's dealing with international collaboration, and we are part of this collaboration. But also, uh, there is this uh, Latin American institution that I found out uh, a couple of years ago, well, a long time ago, but I'm becoming more part of it, that is called the Alaje. And this conference or this organization involves members from more than 15 countries all over South America. And that is how uh, they collaborate. They do some student, also uh, teaching session for the students so they can involve in the space sciences but also it will build a network of researchers all over South America. And I was asking like, okay, well, I need to get some information so I can share with my colleagues at CEDAR. Ah, I have to mention that also the next conference is gonna be in Peru in 2026 is the 15 at Colaje, this conference of uh, Latin America space geophysics. So that will be in Peru. But uh, so if you're interested, uh, let me know. And, so I was asking, okay, well, I need information. So I told him with my friends in Argentina, and they sent me this slide about the space weather center that I have in Tucumán, how are the institutions that are involved, the science that they are working on, and there are the different instruments they have deployed. And maybe we can add some more information or, or just collaborate with them. Maybe we can help us to increase our network, and that will be one way to go. Also, they, they sent me another one, like different groups in Argentina that are working. So you can take a look at the different products, the different instruments that they have uh, with the different universities. So that's also a way to continue collaboration. Also, I talked with my colleagues in Mexico. I was in the last um, collage that I was uh, during the eclipse in April. 
So they have a list of instruments on the left. Uh, this is the National Laboratory for Space Weather. And they have a network instruments that you can see basically in the map. So basically that is also a way to contribute, especially since US and Mexico are close together. So maybe we can, they can work together. And then I went to ask my friends in Brazil. So they say this Embrace is the, the space weather uh, institution for INPI, which is the Instituto Nacional de, oh, National Institute for Space Research that have that. So they sent me this uh, slide about talking about the sun and all this research area and all the instruments that they have. Some of them, uh, some of the instruments on the map are from them, but also they include some other networks that are around South America. And then I start looking at what else do I need to look for? What else, what other networks are there? And, and I was talking about, okay, let's move to Europe now. And there will be a talk by Devon tomorrow, and they will talk about ISCAT 3D, and, and I think we're all very interested in collaborating with the ISCAT system, so that is also another way for collaboration. And also I was asking Koki, like, what is going on in Germany? And he said, well, there is uh, some instrumentation that we have in the northern part of Germany, but also in South America. They have the Simone systems. In Peru, there's another one in Argentina and some other. Of course, the topic is related to the MLT uh, that Koki is really interested in, but also he sent me some slides about the activities of the German Center of Geomagnetism, what are the topics that they are really interested in, uh, what are the universities uh, that are interested in having some collaboration, also the uh, German Space Center of Geophysics, uh, physics, of terrestrial physics, there's also some information over there if we want to go over there. And then like say, okay, well, that's uh, what I was looking for. I didn't get much chance to get more information. So next time I will be more prepared and I think we will get some more information for the different uh, countries and I would like to have a more strong database. But before closing, I would like to mention some, uh, this slide that uh, Enda Woki sent me uh, yesterday about this Amber Magnetometer Network. This is a network of magnetometers that he's been working and studying all over Africa. Uh, the way is to understand the equatorial uh, uh, electrodynamics in the presence of the electrojet. So this is the project is called African Meridian B-Field Education and Research. So, th as I said, there is collaboration all over the world, and I think we as scientists uh, will have the opportunity to, to do it, also trying to make an impact and involve more people in the field that are from other places. So with that, I will conclude my talk. Remember that the international collaboration is always based on common goals, clear communication, respect the differences, establishing trust, uh, flexibility, and adaptability. There's something we can change, there's something we cannot. And thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Any questions? Okay, we are getting close to the break. We have, I think let's thank Danny one more time. You can talk to him over coffee today. And we have, I believe, one announcement from our Senior Science Steering Committee Chair, uh, Mark Condi. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, so I, I want to make sure that everyone is aware or has heard that um, yesterday NASA decided to boldly go where they um, haven't been before in terms of calendar by giving this community a six-month early Christmas present and announcing the selections of the missions that will advance to the concept study report for the dynamic mission. So um, I think there's a slide up here. There were three missions announced, and these are CEDAR scientists, CEDAR institutions that will be funded, I think at a $2 million level, um, to advance this dynamic mission uh, to the next stage, and uh, presumably uh, one of these will be selected for implementation. So the three institutions are here, um, University, of uh, University of Colorado at Boulder. There are two uh, groups from there, one led by Tomoko Matsuo and one led by Amy Merkel, and then Virginia um, Polytech Institute uh, led by Scott Bailey. So this is really exciting. You know, we, we 
uh, had a pr presentation from NASA uh, the other day talking about these missions, uh, and this says that uh, you know we've selected, or NASA has selected missions for implementation. So you know one of the things I really wanted this you know, people coming to this conference to do was to go away excited, and I think feeling that these these missions have been selected to advance uh, shows that there's a commitment to it, and I think that's really exciting. And I think of it as a little Christmas present to our community from NASA. So let's thank NASA for that. Thank you so much, Mark. That's wonderful news. All right, I think it's time for our break. Enjoy your coffee, and we'll see you in a half hour. <laughs>